All right, well, let's go ahead and we're going to conclude our lecture on chapter eight around uh, new product development. So, um, all right, so by way of a little bit of review, uh, we were talking about last week that um, there are these kind of seven steps in the new product development process. And, you know, just to kind of reiterate, the, the purpose of these steps is to uh, start off uh, broadly trying to understand and address a market need or a market opportunity. And then through these phases, take those ideas that we generated in phase one and then uh, methodically um, uh, take that broad set of ideas and narrow them down to ones that uh, the company, the organization should uh, uh, implement. And so that's what this process is for, is to, is to have a, you know, methodology and a thoughtful kind of deliberate approach <clears throat> to determining where the organization is going to invest its resources. Okay. So we looked at all of these different steps. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, if there are any questions, uh, feel, feel free to reach out. Um, there is, uh, by the way, a, a little bit of a shameless plug here. There is a course in the Dayton School that is just focused on new product development. So I would just encourage you, <clears throat> if you want to know more about this topic area that we've been reviewing in chapter eight, then um, you know there is a course uh, that we offer uh, once a year that focuses in particular on this new product development process. So another little shameless plug there. Um, well, let's uh, go on and kind of uh, finish out this chapter and talk about a couple of different uh, ideas. One is this idea of adoption, and the other one is diffusion. So um, if, if we think about a new product or even a new service that is created and offered in the marketplace that people within that target audience have to uh, see the product and then of course begin to embrace it um, and and that probably kind of goes without saying um, but when there is a, um, when there are many, many different types of, or brands of products in a category, um, you know, we, what we want to do, especially if we think about uh, a brand manager, we're, we're kind of winning hearts and minds one at a time. It's like a lot of new ideas in life. And so there is an element of education and persuasion uh, in that process. But separate from that, uh, but, but related is this idea of product diffusion. And so if we think about this idea of product diffusion, we're gonna, we're gonna start to see what the application of this idea, this concept of fusion is going to do to help inform brand manager decision making. So um, we, we might look at this pyramid here um, as, as kind of a, a metaphor for the ways that people uh, within a target audience would adopt a product or a, a service. And, and so you can kind of see, this is like any kind of pyramid. It makes us think a little bit about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs kind of thing, right? Um, and you can see that each one of the steps builds on the prior step. So first of all, 
uh, we would look at this idea of awareness, okay? Um, people can't buy what they don't know about. So um, if, if we think about we need to make people aware of a new product or a new service, then how are we going to do that? Well, kind of the, the, the way to sort of think about that would be this idea of massive advertising, okay? Um, that that kind of seems pretty intuitive. Um, that could be done at different levels and different platforms. It could be obviously social media or TV, radio, web-based, uh, maybe some print. Uh, but again, the idea is to get as many eyeballs on our product or service that is now available uh, that, that that, that we want to communicate with, right? We talked about a couple of weeks ago about segmentation and targeting and positioning. So within this awareness pyramid all the way up to confirmation, again, we are, it kind of assumes really that we've gone through the painstaking effort to segment and target and position our brands and our products and services um, in such a way that we can act on them through this, um, through this kind of this, this uh, marketing pyramid, if you will. So awareness uh, is the first step. And then the second would be interest. So again, people can't buy what they don't know about, and then they won't buy things that they're not interested in. And so maybe there's a special offer, um, you know, in consumer packaged goods, we would think about a coupon or, a, you know, a buy one, get one free or something like that, or a promotional discount. Um, so that that would be one way that we would we would think about it. Uh, the next step would be evaluation. Um, and and uh, in that case, we remember we talked about the, the buying decision-making process. And so we're going to provide information to customers, prospects about what the product or service will do for them to help meet their needs, wants, and, and desires. Um, and then the next step, th this is again kind of thinking about um, consumer packaged goods is probably one of the easiest ones to think about would be a trial size kind of package or a sample. <clears throat> I don't think you see this as much as uh, we used to, but I remember, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we'd get, you know, a little trial size uh, package of toothpaste or mouthwash or shampoo or whatever it may be. And again, the idea is just to get people to try it. You know, you don't know if you like it or not, if you don't try it. And so we're, we're trying to get people within our target audience to try our product or service. Um, and then of course, after people within our target audience have presumably tried the product, then we would hope that they would move to adoption and embracing and they, they feel a sense of, of loyalty uh, to that product or that brand. And then the final thing would be confirmation. So again, we're trying to build the sense of loyalty where uh, in some ways we're hoping that once people try our product or our service, that we build kind of this force field, this metaphorical force field around that purchase process or that decision process so that the next time they have a need for that particular product or service, they don't have to go through all of those decision steps. They just say, hey, this is, um, I tried this once, it worked for me. I'm not going to go through the decision process again because I don't need to. I like this product and I'm going to stick with this product. So.
So, so that's uh, another, uh, or excuse me, that is uh, the way that we would think about this new product or new service adoption. You know, again, this, this reminds us of Levitt's uh, exploiting the product life cycle article that we read a few weeks ago. And this uh, product life cycle kind of holds true. So we have innovators that will start buying the product or service, and then they'll tell their friends or they'll recommend it or what have you. And then more people, these early adopters will start to buy. And then if there are enough early adopters that feel like this product is or service is what it claims to be, then you know what we would see is kind of this this uh, early and late majority. You know, in statistical terms, this would be within one standard deviation away from the mean here. If we look at this middle line, it's the mean that once we make it into this early and late majority, that's where most of our sales are going to come from. Right, about sixty-eight percent of all of our sales are going to happen in this middle area. And then finally, again, when we think about our product life cycle, um, we're going to have some people that, you know, they're going to wait to the bitter end, <laughs> excuse me, before they're going to buy the product or the service. Um, and, you know, we could think about smartphones and people that are older and maybe there are reasons why, you know, maybe there are real physical reasons. The screen's too small it's easy to drop or whatever it may be. Um, or it could be, hey, I'm just a flip phone person. I'm not old, but I just don't need all the fancy stuff. I just need a phone. And so, uh, you know, it may be at that point, again, if we're thinking about uh, smartphones, that people in this laggard category, they're going to wait until, you know, maybe smartphones are so cheap that you know you can pick them up at the local CVS or Walgreens for 22 bucks on a shelf somewhere, right? Um, and so, so that's when the laggards would finally come into play. So, so that's where those two or three kinds of concepts uh, come together. And we think about the adoption period then we think about the product life cycle and how it's really drawn by these different segments of adopters. Um, and, and again, it kind of uh, harkens back to that Levitt product life cycle um, concept. <clears throat> there's been, of course, as you probably would imagine, there's been a lot of academic research around new product uh, diffusion and adoption. And there are um, some pretty sophisticated mathematical models that are, um, you know, that, that have been developed to, to try to predict what, um, you know, what the race rate or the velocity of, um, of new product adoption uh, would be. Um, so again, we, we kind of think about what are some of the factors that would affect this adoption uh, rate. Um, and I was speaking about that just uh, a moment ago. Uh, but kind of at the abstract level, what we would say is that, um, you know, first of all, is there a relative advantage uh, in this new product or new service over the old ones? Is it um, that much uh, better than the old ones? I kind of think about, again, we were talking about smartphones um, as Apple, which um, I've bought iPhones for, you know, the past several years. Uh, whenever a new iPhone comes out, of course, there's a, a little bit faster this and a little bit better that and a little bit clearer this, a little bit more accurate this or what have you. Um, and that that has to be 
those different features and benefits have to be different enough in a in a way that would overcome uh, the incremental price. And uh, if we go back to our uh, uh, this curve here, there you know we're going to have some people in the innovator and early adopter category that even if the camera is just slightly better. Um, you know, they're going to feel like, hey, I got to get rid of the old one. I got to get a new one. Um, and we all know people that that's kind of their approach to new technology. It's not bad. It's just different. Um, and uh, so, you know, that would certainly be one reason why products, new products or services would be adopted more quickly or less quickly. Uh, compatibility, you can imagine. Uh, again, if we stay with smartphones, if I have to change all my apps and I have to change all of my different ways of interacting with my bank and maybe healthcare or school or what have you, if it's radically different, I have to change all those things. I'm probably not going to want to probably not going to want to adopt that new product or new service. Um, Similarly with uh, complexity, people generally want things to be straightforward and simple. And so if the new product or the new service is hard to figure out, then people would in general say, I'm just gonna stick with what I got because I don't really wanna have to learn a new thing. Okay, that, that makes sense. Um, trial ability, is it easy for me to access this new product or new, new service? Um, you know, uh, and, and trial ability and observability kind of go, go together. There might be one here that um, isn't listed, but I think, um, you know, is maybe implicit in relative advantage, and that is uh, price. So. Uh, for example, uh, if I think about, uh, I think Tesla, they're really cool cars. I would like to have one. But for me, the, the, the newness and the coolness of that product, for me personally, is not enough for me to be willing to pay the price for what Teslas are currently sold at. Um, you know, it, I think it's probably more in the luxury category. And, um, you know, for some people, it's just not at a price point where it would be feasible for them. Um, so, so that would be another, uh, I guess, factor that I would say that would affect the rate of adoption. And we walk through all, all of these here. Um, so, so with that, um, I think that really kind of covers everything that I would uh, want to talk about relative to new product development. I do hope that uh, you found this to be interesting. Uh, as I mentioned a couple of lectures ago, uh, for me in my career, uh, working with new products and services is fascinating and it's exciting. It's probably the coolest times of my uh, professional uh, industry life is working with some of those new products and um, it's uh, it, it definitely is a, is a neat thing to be a part of so uh, with that thanks a lot and I will see you in class shortly.